taken from St. Luke chapter 21. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations by reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves. Men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. For the powers of heaven shall be moved. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and majesty. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. And he spoke to them with similitude, See the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth their fruit, you know that summer is nigh. So you also, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <coughs> <coughs> By way of announcement, this week, uh, Father uh, Joe Pfeiffer is in India. He's on a meeting with the priests out in India, and they will also be venerating the incorrupt body of St. Francis Xavier that is carried in procession at this time. Uh, December 3rd is the Feast of St. Francis Xavier. And also, uh, there are 12 slash 13 studying there's a few visa problems, but uh, 12 to 13 seminarians studying now in Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Boston, Kentucky. Do pray for them and um, pray for these uh, generous young men to come to test their vocation. And some will be brothers. We hope to have as well lay brothers and down the road uh, sisters, God willing sisters who will uh, revive the hospital work and teach catechism and uh, hours of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. So do pray for all these intentions. And as you know, there's about 75, 80 priests on the line of the resistance throughout the world. And uh, many of them are supportive, but not acting. But the ones that are acting are about 75 to 80 throughout the world, including Father Ringrose here in Virginia, and Father Ortiz is with him. And um, um, in the Canada, we have Father Patrick Giroud, who uh, a lot of the priests, because of health, because of whatever reasons, they, they're not traveling. They just stay in one place and take care of their flock. Especially in Europe, they do this. But um, we just want to continue what the Archbishop started, which was continue the, what the Catholic Church has always done, teaching the true doctrine, combating the errors of the time that go against the Catholic faith, and uh, sanctifying souls. And uh, many souls are crying out for the, la the true Mass and the true doctrine. And the Archbishop warned us, Archbishop Lefebvre warned that the problems of the future are going to be more camouflaged. The enemy will be more camouflaged. So they will have the Latin Mass. They will, they will wear the cassock like the modernists of 100 years ago. When St. Pius X condemned the modernists 100 years ago, there was no uh, altar girls, there was no new mass. They were all traditional masses and traditional cassocks. But their heads were full of modernism and liberalism. And that's the danger coming, said Archbishop Lefebvre. The Opus Dei type of liberalism, where you have all the externals, like the indult mass, like the, the um, uh, masses of St. Peter's and the masses of... Uh, Good Shepherd Institute in France and Campos in Brazil. All the externals are there, but the acceptance of Vatican II modernism 
the acceptance of the new mass in principle. Once you accept all this, you're gone. And that's, that's what Archbishop Lefebvre warned would be the grave danger of the future, where you have traditional exterior, but internal poison in the head. Also, of course, we have to pray and make reparation for the terrible, terrible scandal of, the, of yesterday, uh, Pope Francis praying and meditating, standing in a, the synagogue, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. He's visiting there now, and he's praying in a Muslim mosque with Muslims. You know as well as I, faithful, this the first commandment comes down with lightning and thunder, smashing, destroying such a concept. It is, it is so serious, a sin against the first commandment, and such a scandal to the whole world. Oh, the whole world applauds this, this Pope because he's, he's friendly to the Freemasons, he's friendly to the communists, he's friendly to the perverts, he's friendly to the divorced and remarried who want to go to communion and sacrilegious communions. He's friendly to all the enemies of Christ. <laughs> so what is our Lord going to say when this Pope stands before him on his judgment? and Paul VI, and Pope John Paul II, and Pope Benedict XVI, who are all the same line. Do not think that Pope Francis is all that different from Pope Paul VI. He's not. He's not. He's more colorful and, and less, he might even be more honest, because he really is a, a modernist. While Pope Paul VI, he knew he was destroying Catholic tradition. He had a guilty conscience. And Archbishop Lefebvre said you could see it in his face. It was a schizophrenic Pope Paul VI. He was, uh, and as Archbishop Lefebvre put it, hundreds of years ago it was three popes but one church. Now we have one pope over two churches. The conciliar church, which we reject, and the Catholic church, which we are, and stay and fight for it till we die. <clears throat> so the scandal of Pope Francis, just repeating the scandal of 2006 of Pope Benedict XVI, praying in a mosque, and of course the world applauds it, and many Catholics who are losing their faith, they say, well, I guess all religions really are the same. I guess the Catholic Church really is just the best of the bunch of many that you can be saved in. And many Catholics are losing their faith, and they lose it by the slow dosage of morphine. They just go numb and then they lose it. And that's the danger now, what's happening in tradition. You go numb because you don't fight. If you don't fight modernism, especially the priests, if you don't fight this monster, this disease, this slippery eel, if you don't fight it, you catch it. And that's why St. Pius X, when he dealt with modernism, did he dialogue? Did he hold synods and banquet discussions? Did he ha hold friendly hands and embraces to the modernists? St. Pius X pulled out the sledgehammer. He pulled out the M16. <laughs> he just cleaned the field. And all those rats and snakes went underground. And they would rise up again after he died. Under Pope Benedict XVI, they started to work. And under Pius XI, Pius XI, because he didn't consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he made some big blunders. He made some very good, uh, good encyclicals condemning ecumenism on the kingship of Christ. But because he didn't consecrate Russia the way Our Lady asked, uh, he made some big blunders whereby the church suffered. And, and then under Pius XII, these rats were working. And then, of course, at Vatican II, all the snakes and rats and hyenas, they just took over, hijacked the Catholic Church. That was 50 years ago, no, well, 52 years ago now. And um, Catholics are getting weary. They're getting tired of this fight. Priests are saying, well, we can't fight all the time. And they're laying down their weapons. And Bishop Filet has asked the society priests, start laying down your weapons. We have to seek an agreement now. 
And uh, the agreement is not so much the big deal as the compromise of doctrine. That's the big deal. Once you abandon the stand for Catholic truth, you slip and slip and slip and fall. And that's what's happening. And how do we know the doctrine has been compromised? Well, look it, look it up yourself. And uh, the recusant has just put out a booklet, Greg Taylor put out a booklet, just showing the cold facts. It's a booklet just with all the evidence. And you can look it up, the recusant, I think .com or .org, whatever it is. And uh, you can order this booklet. Maybe we can get some make available for you. It's not that expensive. I don't even know if he's asking a price for it. But it's just the cold, boring documents. And read them yourself. The general chapter statement. The six conditions for an agreement with Rome, whereby the society bound itself. The general chapter, uh, um, the, the, the letter of the three bishops to Bishop Fillet, warning him, don't go in this direction. And now he's got three bishops with him going in that direction. And then uh, the April 15th doctrinal declaration, a terrible modernist document, a terrible document. That's the one that accepts Vatican II in the light of tradition, that accepts religious liberty as workable, accepts the new mass as legitimate, which is very grave, because the archbishop always condemned it as illegitimate, the new mass poisonous. And then, um, and then uh, all the interviews of CNS, Dietschy, and the continual doublespeak that has been going on ever since. For example, uh, I have heard seminarians themselves in Winona say, I talked to Bishop Fillet, and he told me, this happened uh, a year and a half ago, he told me there's no more discussions with Rome, it's over. And then Monsignor Pozzo, in an interview two weeks ago, what does he say? He says, oh, well, we've been meeting with Bishop Fillet all along, many times. So this doublespeak is, is not of our Lord. It's not of our Lord who spoke openly. So do pray, and we must, you must not uh, get numb. If you're tired in this battle, it's only been 52 years. Look back in history. The Arian crisis, the Arian heresy, and then semi-Arianism, which was like modernism and then modernism with the casting. These heresies lasted, that battle lasted over 100 years. And then look at the Protestant persecution in England. That's well over 100 years. Priests having the same mass, being hunted down like animals. And the people who held the priests in their house, if they were caught having a priest in their house, with mass, they were arrested, imprisoned, fined, or put to death. And some of those brave ladies, like St. Anne Lyne and uh, Margaret Clitheroe, they told the, these Protestant jury, they told them that we were happy to have a priest and we were happy to have many more priests stay at our place to have mass. And if I could die one death, I wish I could die a thousand for the Catholic faith. And these brave girls, and of course brave priests and monks, and look at uh, the French Revolution. All that persecution lasted easily over 50 years, and it was bloody. And in, uh, and in Mexico also, there wasn't just the 1926 to 30 war, there was the 1931 to 35 Cristero battle also. But in that one, the clergy turned against the Cristeros and the clergy were all in favor of a false peace with the Freemasons. So the poor Catholic people, and there were several number of Cristero priests who stayed with these Cristeros to pray mass with them and encourage them. But it was a long drawn out fight. And all, even as late as 1937, even into the 40s, there was still hunting down and persecutions going on in Mexico. And only in 19, what was it, 1992, I think, or 1990, that the Mexican government permitted again the priests to wear cassock in public. So 
This fight for the faith is, we're still puppies. We're still young in this fight. And the Virgin Mary said, it's going to get rough. And we all know why. We all know why. Firstly, if the Pope will not consecrate Russia to the American Heart of Mary, it's going to just keep spiraling downward everything. Politically, economically, socially, and of course, uh, in the Catholic Church. That is the only solution. But why don't the popes consecrate Russia? Why are they so allergic to this request of the Mother of God? That seems so simple. Now, Pius XII, he consecrated Russia, but he didn't do it with all the bishops of the world. And Our Lady was very upset with him. And he had visions. He had, he had miraculously seen the miracle of the sun. Our Lady gave it for him to, just so to move him to obey Fatima. But he didn't do it the way she asked. So, why? Archbishop Lefebvre gives the answer. It's very interesting. The answer is because the modernists, one, the one doctrine they hate the most is the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. They hate that doctrine because the Freemasons have worked for over 500 years to, to smash the crown off Christ the King, put him on a level of equality with false religions, ecumenism and separation of church and state, freedom of all religions in the state, which is a, a heresy condemned by the church, condemned by common sense, if you say all religions are equal and they all have different beliefs that contradict one another then they're all equally false and if they're all equally false then the young people say well religion is just for the birds and for uh, old ladies religion is a joke and it leads as Pope Leo XIII said as St. Pius X said it leads logically to atheism and so the United States SSR is more communist than Soviet Russia under Stalin right now. Because all our kids are being perverted with filthy education and twisted education. The public schools now, they're demanding the kids, they can't say God bless you when they sneeze, they're, they want bless you. The teachers are being told, uh, don't, don't use gender language anymore. Don't say boys line up over here girls line up over there. Use something more general like uh, the, all you students over here and all the athletes over here. And they're being taught into this non-gender uh, separation language. It's, it's deeply perverse. The whole thing is perverse. And uh, we are watching socialism just take over our country. And it's a, we deserve it for our sins. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning because the, the slavery and the cruelty of, of communism, when it, when it shows its teeth and claws, as it did under Stalin, with all the concentration camps and all the deaths and all the mass graves, it's just the beginning. But it's because of sin. Because of sin. So why God has permitted this? It's because of sin at root. But why, why is it that the popes have not consecrated Russia? And Archbishop Lefebvre, he hits it right on the nail. He says, because what does the consecration of Russia mean? It means the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in Russia and through Russia over the whole world. And it means the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means. It means through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Christ will reign again socially. He will be recognized by the constitutions of the country. His name will be written in the constitutions. The Catholic religion is the only religion established by Christ, and the state will only recognize this true religion, as nations did in the ages of the faith. That is what they hate so much. And that means no more abortion laws. That means no more divorce at a phone call. That means no more contraceptives sold like candy in our stores and in given free in the public schools and Catholic schools to the damnation of so many bishops. 
permitting this. And it means uh, no more abortion clinics. It means no more uh, rock and roll on TV because the Catholic state would forbid rotten music, which corrupts the morals of the people. That's why uh, Vladimir Putin, I'm not praising him as a Catholic leader or anything, but he has a little more sense than most leaders today or appears to have. And he recently said about the United States, Obama is making this country a sewage, a septic tank. But it's not Obama, it's the people who want it. The people want vice. They want to live in sin. They want the pornography. They want the filth. They want the divorce and easy living together. And that's why God is permitting such a punishment. It's going to be a heavy punishment to pay. So the kingship of Christ is at the root of this. And if the Pope consecrates Russia the way Our Lady did it, it will be totally politically incorrect. <laughs> And it will be the miraculous conversion of Russia and the whole world back to the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what they don't want. And how do we know they don't want this? What's the proof? Because the Catholic Church has always taught in the great popes, Gregory the Sixteenth, Pius the Tenth, Pius the Ninth, Pius the Eleventh, Pius the Twelfth, Benedict the Fifteenth, all these good popes, Leo the Thirteenth also, especially. The Catholic Church has always taught infallibly and with full ordinary and extraordinary magisterium that the duty of the state is to recognize the true religion. Why? Because Caesar must render to God the things that are God's as well. Render to God the things that are God's, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But Caesar has a job too. Caesar was created by God. The state is a creation from God. So the state has the duty to recognize the true God and the true faith. Because Caesar, that is all the presidents and kings and leaders of countries, they will also be judged by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Catholic Church has always taught this. And we American Catholics, we have been poisoned by 200 years of, of liberal Catholicism. That's why the 50s Although it had many good externals, it was wrong that the bishops did not rally the people to work for a social kingship of Jesus Christ, to work for a Catholic state. Oh, that's an impossible dream. No, it's not. And if Catholics were instructed and taught that they must work for this, they must study why, study the encyclicals of the great Pope, study the teaching of the church, Know your catechism and look at the lives of the martyrs who died for the kingship of Christ. And the, we Americans, we've been poisoned with this liberalism for 200 years. The clergy were totally infected. And it was this religious liberty, this idea of the pluralist society that all religions can work together and the Catholicism will automatically flourish in such a system, that heresy triumphed at Vatican II. And Vatican II, as you know well, attacks Jesus Christ as God and attacks especially his kingship. The document on religious liberty and ecumenism and collegiality smash the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it's so serious. It's an attack against our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the fight of the faith is all about to stand up to defend the honor and the kingship and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and his Roman Catholic Church of all time. So Vatican II, they, they don't, it, was, it was a direct assault on our Lord's kingship. And all the liberals said, oh great, we're, we're modern now, we're, modern democracy, we're, modern we're in modern democracy times, and uh, the kingship of Christ, that's for the old days, that's for the Middle Ages, and we have to be realistic, we have to be friendly to the modern world, and so forth. But what kind of friendliness to the modern world is the Pope praying in the mosque? Praying with Jews, Muslims, Protestants, praising Martin Luther like Benedict XVI, holding Martin Luther up as a model for all Christians to follow. <laughs> What's the result of this false doctrine? We will see it 
We're going to see the fruits of this false doctrine on the day of judgment. All the souls who have gone to hell because of the scandals of these popes and the scandal of Vatican II and the scandal of the bishops being silent and not preaching out against Vatican II. Where were they all 52 years ago? And all the priests, they all knew their Thomism, they all knew their catechism. Why were not more of them rising up to speak out against it? And you know what it is? It's called the duct tape. And the duct tape has a big word on it, obedience. Satan's masterstroke was to sow disobedience to all tradition through a false obedience, Archbishop Lefebvre. And he said that, he said many times, it's a sin to obey sinful orders. It's not true obedience. And now obedience is being used again to silence all the society priests. They're not allowed to speak out against the doctrinal declaration. If they do, they know what's coming. And, and now they're, they're just trying, many good priests are just trying to, as, uh, as Father Pfeiffer put it, they're being, uh, they're losing clear vision by all the smoke and incense of Menzingen. Menzingen is the headquarters of the society. In the name of obedience, they are caving in. So, the consecration of Russia means the social kingship of Christ. That's why the Masons will do everything to stop the consecration of Russia, the way Our Lady asked, by the Pope. It's interesting that Our Lady also says it's the Pope of Rome that must do the consecration. Not the Patriarch of Constantinople, not the Patriarch of, of uh, Istanbul or wherever. It has to be the Pope of Rome. And it also is, in a way, a safeguard to the danger of Sedevicantism. Because if there's no Pope, then who's going to consecrate Russia? And uh, I know, I, I don't have the answer. These are confusing times. This, this Pope does put a question mark on himself. But, the, but he is not so different from Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI. And Archbishop Lefebvre never said they were not popes. He questioned, hmm, maybe there'll be a day when the church will pronounce that they were not popes, or they were be, they'll certainly be condemned, like Formosus, he was condemned. You can read that story. For Moses was dug up from the grave and condemned by the a good pope. So, but the archbishop's position was, was in line with Our Lady of Fatima. Who's going to consecrate Russia if not the pope? How can the pope do it if he's not the pope? So, all, all tells us that this pope, who Francis, is the pope, and it will be the pope that must consecrate Russia. And until the, the, the consecration is done, we can't expect all that bright sunny days much more. And, and God has put us in this time to be children of the Virgin Mother, children of His Immaculate Mother, children to fight under her banner. And this is our honor in these days to rally around the Immaculate Heart of Mary, wear her scapular, it is not a good luck charm. The scapular is not some superstitious cloth. It is a powerful sacramental. It, and it, uh, Our Lady works through this sac sacramental. It's a protection. And many, many miracles have been worked through it. And one of the greatest miracles that she promises is if you die wearing the scapular, you will not suffer eternal fire. What an immense grace in an age when any of us so easily can slip and fall in a mortal sin. And if we die unrepentant, we go to hell. Hell is no joke. Hell is real. That's why she showed hell to the children of Fatima. That's why she, our Lord allows Sister Josefa Menendez to go down into hell for six or seven hours at a time. And she saw hell. She heard the blasphemy. She heard the screaming. She heard the curses of priests and nuns and lay people cursing their life. A 15-year-old girl she saw in hell. She'd be 93 this year. 15-year-old girl cursing her life. 
and burning there forever and ever. Hell is no joke. There is no vacation time in hell. And Our Lady and Our Lord sent Sister Joseph Amenides. She would be in her convent. She'd be walking down the corridor and she would hear screams and deep voices and chains. And she knew, she would start trembling because she knew what this meant. And she would say, Lord, I don't want to go, but I want to do your will. If your will is I go for you, for the, to save souls from hell, I will go. And she would see the devils actually surrounding her, binding her with chains, and dragging her straight down into hell. It's quite impressive, this, this account of Sister Joseph Amenides. You should read it. It's in the book, The Way of Divine Love. And her confessor, uh, he, he vouched that it was all genuine. And what's interesting is Sister Josefa Menendez, her sister, I think her sister's name was Sister Madeline, she became a nun in Portugal under, uh, she became the novice mistress over Sister Lucia. So Sister Lucia of Fatima, she saw hell, and the sister of Sister Joseph Menendez, who were, was her novice mistress in the Carmelite convent in Coimbra in Portugal, uh, also went into hell. So you can bet they had some very interesting hellish conversations uh, at recreation time in the convent. And because both of them were connected with those who saw hell. And so these nuns, they understood hell is real and many souls are going. So that's the bottom line. That's the triumph of Vatican II. And so it's, it's the kingship of Christ that's at the heart of the fight. And that's why when Father Chazal and Father, both Father Pfeiffers asked Bishop Follet back in 2011, no, 2010, are you going to come out strong against a CZ3, like Archbishop Lefebvre did? And Bishop Follet said no. And he made, he made one little burp and one little sermon in Austria, but there was no big rallying against this smashing of the first commandment by the Pope. Why? Because all these steps of duct taping for the agreement and the canonical recognition from Rome. And it's still going on. We are now two years since this doctrinal declaration. And in two years, I have seen already priests slipping and falling. Priests who two years ago said, there'll never be an agreement. And now they're saying, well, an agreement would be a good thing. And the doctrinal declaration, uh, we can never accept the new mass as legitimate. Now they're saying, well, it's legitimately promulgated and the Pope has the authority to do that. So you see they're sliding. And what's worse is many of the faithful, because they're not being warned against this fight and this battle, many of the faithful are just going to sleep. So that if tomorrow Bishop Follet announces we're recognized by Rome, we're under the diocese, everything is sunshine and glory. All the faithful are going to be singing the Te Deum. They're going to be applauding because they've been numbed. They've been, they've been uh, all, all barriers and all uh, immunity system has been broken down. Two years ago, if he made that announcement, half the parishes would walk out. But now if that announcement is done, nobody's going to care. Nobody's really going to care. And that's why, dear faithful, we're in, we're in a real new phase of the war. And the principles always are the same. Don't compromise the Catholic faith. That's it. Stay faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay, and, and as Catholics, we must believe and we must pray for, we must desire the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he reign over all hearts, over our souls, over politics, over economics, mm -hmm. the whole social order. 
That is what we are about, especially the Catholic men. This is something the Catholic men have not fought for in the USA and in Canada. In Mexico, they did. The men rose up. They weren't experienced soldiers. They didn't go through uh, Paris Island boot camps. They didn't go on Navy SEAL training. They were just dads who had farms. But they saw that the Catholic faith was being threatened that the Masonic government was crushing the Catholic Church, and they were not going to sit back and just ride along, oh, we'll see what happens. No. They rose up. They gathered all throughout Mexico. Men just gathered. They, they thought, well, we'll just get slaughtered, but at least we get killed for the right cause. But Our Lady helped the Cristeros, and they had victory after victory after victory, and visible miracles that happened in these battles. And the priests, and one of them, uh, a bishop, Bishop, Bishop Orozco, Bishop Orozco, he lived with the Cristeros in the mountains. He said mass for them, encouraged them, and he got a telegram from Rome, from Cardinal Gasperi, who said, why are you lowering yourself to live among these filthy peasants? You are cardinal. Don't degrade your dignity in this way. And the great Bishop Orozco said, wrote back a telegram and said, Your Excellency, if you saw the faith of these Cristero soldiers and these people and the women, don't forget the women and the girls were just as brave. They were transporting ammunition, transporting telegrams and messages, and risking their life. And sometimes they had to dress up like men, like Cristeros, with a fake mustache, and uh, sometimes as <laughs> elegant ladies that they were, they were called the jo St. Joan of Arc Brigade. And these girls were incredibly brave. And some of them were arrested. But uh, Bishop Orozco said, if you saw the courage of these Cristeros, it would, it would, it would remind <laughs> you of the strong faith of the early Catholics in the catacombs. And he said, don't worry, I don't degrade my dignity among these fighting sheep. And so, uh, so the men fought. They understood the reign of Christ the King and how many went to death shouting, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King, being shot. And most of them refusing blindfold. And uh, uh, two Carmelite nuns were also shot, Mother Mary Elias of the Blessed Sacrament and another old nun. They were shot, refusing blindfold. Most of them were, died and went straight to heaven. But in the case of Mother Mary Elias, she was shot. She prayed to St. Teresa, St. Teresa, if you spare me, I will build a convent in your honor. <laughs> so they were shot. And they had, blood, they had blood wounds, and the soldiers walked off. An hour later, they woke up. Both nuns, they had the blood stains, but they were fine. And then someone appeared to them and, and escorted them out, showed them a way to, to escape out of where they were kept in prison. And Mother Mary Elias moved to the United States. She founded that convent in honor of St. Teresa in Buffalo, New York. And it's still standing today. It's Novus Ordo, of course. And her body is buried in uh, near Grand Rapids, Michigan. So uh, these people understood the kingship of Christ. But we Americans, especially the men, we have to rediscover the Catholic teaching. And maybe that's why God has shaken the soul down to this level, so that we finally become Catholic. And stop pretending that separation of church and state and the goddess of liberty in the New York Harbor are so great. They're not. The real Statue of Liberty is the Virgin Mary, Our Lady of the Rosary, that stands in Santa Fe in the Basilica. Carried in, the first statue of Our Lady carried into the United States from the Spanish missionaries. That's the real Statue of Liberty. And when this country, if it becomes Catholic, uh, and when it becomes Catholic, it wouldn't take too much adjustment to turn our, the Statue of Liberty into Our Lady. It was a gift from the Freemasons, as you know.
because they were all working together. The Ben Franklins and the Thomas Jeffersons were working with the uh, beheading, decapitating revolutionaries of the Freemasons in France. They were all buddies and all working for the same goal, which was the dethroning of Christ the King, <coughs> the burial of Christ the King. So we Catholics, we got to convert again. And that's what Archbishop Lefebvre was about. He was not about, oh, let's make an agreement with Rome and experiment with tradition. He was not about being fluffy and cotton candy with the modernists. He was anything but. And that's why Bishop Williamson says many of the liberal SSPX priests now, they followed Archbishop Lefebvre because they saw this gentle dove, as he puts it. He was very kind and very gentle, and he was, he was a saint, there's no doubt. But there was a side to Archbishop Lefebvre that when he had to fight for the faith, the iron fist came out. The boxer came out. The, the Balboa of Catholicism, of tradition, pulled up, put on his boxing gloves. When he had to fight, he fought. And that's the side they forget about. And that's what the new documentary on the life of Archbishop Lefebvre, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's nice, it's sweet, but it takes the boxing gloves off of the Archbishop Lefebvre. And that's what he's about, the, the reign of Christ the King. He spoke about it, preached about it, lived it, it was in his heart. And that's why he opposed popes. That's why he opposed Vatican II and all the bishops. That's why he opposed the whole world, because of the kingship of Christ. And if you want to read a good nutshell of, of what he really says and thinks, they have uncrowned him. They have uncrowned him. It's, it's pretty heavy whiskey. It's, it's not light reading. But it's worth, especially you men, read it, pray over it, mark it, mark it, and think about it. Because that's really what we are about. To be Catholic means we must love our Lord Jesus Christ as God, as our King. And not some imaginary king of the Middle Ages, but a king now, over the USA, with his heart on our flag, with his name on our constitution, with the, this country obeying and respecting the laws of God. And then you would see, in such a Catholic order, the large families again, the, the stable economy, a politics that is just, a politics that defends the, the poor, that defends the real uh, common good of society, the true common good, which is to lead souls to heaven. And the Catholic Church has taught this over and over again, but we don't know it because we, the, the American bishops just buried it in the drawers. When Cardinal Gibbons got the letter uh, Testem Benevolentiae from Pope Leo XIII condemning the errors of Americanist heresy, he just put it in the drawer. And when they got Quantacura, the bishops put it in the drawer. They said, oh, that's a European problem. It's not here. But now this American problem of, of freedom of all religions has infected the whole Catholic Church. And now the whole church is infected with it. And it's a real heresy. So we Catholics got to start thinking Catholic again and working for the kingship of Christ again. And the key instrument for this to take place is the consecration of Russia. And we got to understand what it really means to consecrate Russia. That means the social kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why our battle now is, is grave, because when Bishop Follet and the leaders of the Society of St. Pius X signed that religious liberty is workable with the church's magisterium, sorry, that is a compromise of the Catholic faith. We cannot go along with that. And if you or I signed on to that document, I know I would go straight to hell. Because I know what it means. And I know, I know Bishop Fillet knows what it means. And I know all the priests know what it really means that have studied modernism. And uh, pray for Bishop Fillet that he publicly condemned this for his own soul and pray for the priest to have strength to rise up against this compromise of the holy Catholic faith. The priests are the watchdogs. We're the dogs that guard the sheep. We're supposed to bark against the wolves. 
And what good are the dogs if they just sit there watching the wolves <laughs> come in, devouring the sheep? But that's what's happening. And the duct tape, again, is false obedience. And the archbishop, he refused to be duct taped by false obedience. And he spoke out against modernism, spoke out against the modernism of Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul II, to the day he died. Did he reject the Pope? No, he prayed for the Pope. Was he disrespectful and arrogant? And No, he was very respectful to the authority of the Pope, but he did not hesitate to send a caricature, a drawing, right before Assisi won in 1986. Remember that drawing? He sent it to the Pope, and it was not mocking the Pope, but it was just being realistic. And it showed Pope John Paul II before the gates, at the gates of Assisi, saying to Jesus and Mary, oh, you're not welcome here. And then, and then Pope John Paul II before the gates of heaven, and Jesus and Mary saying, ecumenists are not welcome here. And the devil is on the side saying, uh, whistling, saying, over here, buddy, ecumenists this way. And the archbishop, today they would accuse him of being disrespectful and who knows what. But he said himself, the Pope will not listen to my speech. He will not listen to my letters. The only way I can get through to him, to try to get through to him, is a drawing. And that didn't work either. So, uh, dear faithful, never lose sight of the fight we're in. It's the Catholic doctrine. Doctrine first. Doctrine first. Doctrine first. And if you keep the faith, you will save your soul. But if you don't keep your faith, we'll lose our soul. You cannot please God, nor can we save our soul without the true faith. And what is the true faith? It's to believe all that Christ taught, all that God has revealed in Scripture and tradition. And part of the tradition is the magisterium of the Catholic Church, condemning all the modern errors that Vatican II now promotes. And now that Bishop Fillet is, is softened on and weakened on and signed on to, so we're in war, it's tough, but we're only 52 years <laughs> into this war. And I remind you, I, I'm sorry I know this is getting long, but I remind you, especially the youngsters among you, don't forget, 52 years ago, uh, in, well, in 1965, Vatican II ended. And then 45 years ago today, November 30th, 1969, some of you will remember this. November 30th, 1969, everybody went to Sunday Mass, expecting, you know, the regular, normal, traditional Latin Mass. Oh, hum, how boring, and let's get out of here. We got golf games to get to, and normal Catholic life. But it wasn't normal that Sunday. They walked in and they began the Mass. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Mass of Paul VI. The Lord be with you. And then the offering of the gifts, the dropping of the offertory, Mass facing the people, and, uh, and all the other, no the, whole, the whole intrinsically evil Novus Ordo Mass. And where were all the people to rise up and say, this is not Catholic, we're getting out of here. Let's go storm the bishop and drag him out in the town square and challenge him. Is that what happened? No. It was all obedience, obedience, obedience. And Pope Paul VI, Pope Paul VI, the Pope of Rome, he sealed this direction when he said these words, speaking about that Sunday, First Sunday of Advent, 1969. The first reason is not simply canonical, relating to an external precept. It is connected with the charism of the liturgical act. This is Paul VI. In other words, this new Mass is linked with the power and efficacy of the Church's prayer, the most authoritative utterance of which comes from the bishops. 
This is also true of priests who help the bishop in his ministry and like him acts in the person of Christ. It is Christ's will. It is the breath of the Holy Spirit. This is inaugurating the new mass, which calls the church to make this change. A prophetic moment is occurring in the mystical body of Christ, which is the church. This moment is shaking the church, arousing it, obliging it to renew the mysterious art of its prayer. And then he speaks about the giving up of Latin. Here it is. Um, the words of Pope Paul VI. This was given in allocution in Rome on Wednesday of the 26th of November, 1969, because many people, he heard rumblings that Catholic people were complaining about this new mass. So here's what he said. The introduction of the vernacular, that is English in the English-speaking countries, German in German-speaking countries, and so forth. The introduction of the vernacular will certainly be a great sacrifice for those who know the beauty, the power, and the expressive sacrality of Latin. We are parting with the speech of the Christian centuries. We are becoming like profane intruders in the literary preserve of sacred utterance. We have reason indeed for regret. This is his schizophrenia. We have reason for regret, for almost, almost for bewilderment. What can we put in the place of that language of the angels? We are giving up something of priceless worth. So the Pope Paul VI, in his so many words, crowned the abandoning of the Tridentine Mass and the promotion of Vatican II. And this Pope would say traditional things, and he would say modernist things. He would say traditional doctrine and throw in modernist doctrine. And that's why I dare to say this has been the behavior of the Superior General of the Society. He's behaving like this. One side of his mouth says, I don't like the new mass. The other side of the mouth, he says, well, Archbishop Lefebvre would have not taken the steps he did if he saw this new mass in Latin, in Gregorian chant, in full vestments. And uh, Bishop Follet will say, Vatican II is bad, I don't accept it. But he signs on to Vatican II is acceptable in the light of tradition, and religious liberty is reconcilable with the church's tradition. He will say the new mass, uh, I, don't, I don't like it. But then he'll say the new mass is, is legitimately promulgated. So you got this double speak, just like Pope Paul VI in the time of the revolution. So that the traditional Catholic people in the pews, they said, well, there's no way the Pope can favor this. There's no way the Pope can back this. See, he says traditional things. And then the liberals in the pew would say, no, the Pope wants this progress and moving forward because look, he said this and he said this and he said this out of the same Pope's mouth. And you know as well as I, what did Pius X call such a character? When one side of their mouth speaks modernism, the other speaks traditional Catholicism. Out of the same mouth, same head, same person. Pius X nailed it as, that's what you call a, a Joe modernist, folks. That is Joe modernist. That's how they work. That's how they speak. They don't work in the open. So it's a great mystery what is happening in the Catholic Church. We all suffer. And Sister Lucia said there'll be a day when everyone, every Catholic, will suffer for the faith. And we are. We are, all of us. We would much rather prefer to be under a glorious Pius X, under a glorious time of history with the church running like a well-oiled well machine, but it's not. And God has put us in this time of fighting, in this time of war. Why? To make peace? No. To war to make war. That's what we're, we have to make war with the spiritual weapons that God gave us. Battle with the true doctrine without compromise, the daily rosary, the brown scapular, through these you'll save your soul. So persevere, little flock, and uh, let's now go to the true Catholic mass that was overthrown in the 69 revolution. And remember, in 1969, 
That was four years after the end of Vatican II. Four years. People didn't see anything. And uh, we are only two years after Vatican II in the SSPX. And everybody's saying, well, I don't see the new Mass. I don't see anything different. But there's a lot that's changing in the teaching, in the doctrine. And if, if, if 11 traditional groups can compromise with Vatican II in the new Mass and are now saying the new Mass, is the SSPX exempt? It's not. So pray, I beg you, for all the priests, the priests that you know. Pray for them and pray really, I, I, I say this truthfully, that for their real conversion. Because liberal Catholicism doesn't cut it. We can't save our soul through liberal Catholicism, but through the real Catholic teaching, the real Catholic doctrine, and the real king that we die, fight and die for, because he died and fought for us. And in this Mass, the very King of Heaven comes down, and he will feed you with his precious body, his blood. He will inflame your hearts with his burning sacred heart, that you receive in communion. And he says to you, the king himself, fight on. Remember all the voice of my, my popes, of all my vicars, of all my saints, and on my son, Archbishop Lefebvre. Fight on with, for the same faith, for the same doctrine, the same sacraments, the same Catholic Church of all time. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs>